My name is Nick Borson. A while ago I posted a video um, about using classes in PowerShell. And in the last example in that video, I, I demonstrated a, uh, a little script that, um, in which that, that had several classes that were related to each other. Some classes were based on other classes. So this was using inheritance. But in that video, I really only scratched the surface. So um, this video is more of a deep dive specifically on the topic of inheritance. So I'm going to start by just very briefly revisiting that PowerShell example, but I will include, include a link to the original video in the description if you want to watch the whole thing. Uh, but then I'm going to talk kind of conceptually about what inheritance means in the context of object-oriented programming. Then we'll go into a, a simple C-sharp demo. Then I'll explain some more concepts that we used in that demo, uh, polymorphism and interface versus implementation inheritance. So like the difference between abstract and virtual methods and, and also interface types. Then we'll do more demos. And finally, I'll give a, uh, a quick peek kind of under the hood of how this all works, how objects are represented in memory and how virtual function calls actually work. All right, so here's the PowerShell script from my previous video. In this script, we have a base class defined on line two called expr, short for expression. And this is meant to represent any kind of mathematical expression. But then we have derived classes that represent specific kinds of mathematical expressions. So on line nine, we have class constant, which derives from expr. So we use the colon there to indicate that. And constant is a mathematical is an expression that simply represents a constant value. So we have a value property, and the eval method just returns that value. So the root, the base type has declares the eval method, but it doesn't really we don't really use that. Um, but the derive types override that eval method to return to do specific things. Similarly, product represents the product an expression that's the product of two numbers. So you know left times right. It has two other expressions representing the left and right arguments. And then the eval method evaluates the left and right expressions and multiplies them together. And similar for power, we take the left expression to the power of the right expression. And using these, putting these all together, we can build an abstract syntax tree representing a mathematical expression. In this case, 1.5 times 10 to the third. So we have the whole expression is the product of two sub-expressions, the constant 1.5 and the power of 10 to the third. When we evaluate that root expression, we get the expected result, which is 1,500. All right, I breezed through that example pretty quickly. Let's slow down and explain some concepts. So inheritance is associated with object-oriented programming, which is a style of programming that emphasizes objects. And I say style of programming, programming because people sometimes talk about object-oriented programming as a language feature, like this language is object-oriented and that language is not object-oriented. But really, object-oriented programming is more of a paradigm or a way of thinking about programming. And certain languages do have features that are designed to make object-oriented programming easier. So in C Sharp, we use <clears throat> C-sharp uses a, a, an approach that is based on classes, which is kind of the most popular way of doing object-oriented programming. Uh, and the way that that works is you create a class to define the data format and the available methods and so on. And then you create an object as an instance of the class. So in this class-based approach, inheritance is a relationship between classes. So when you define a class, you can specify its base class. And in, 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 for example, if we say class A colon B, <clears throat> then B is the base class of A, or A is based on B, and A is the derived class. So the derived class, A in this case, inherits from the base class. So what do we mean by inheritance? <clears throat> well, part of what it means is that all the stuff that is part of the base class is inherited by the, the derived class. Um, <clears throat> so all the fields and the methods and so on that are part of B, uh, the base class, are implicitly included in A, the derived class. And then on top of that, 
the derived class may define additional fields and methods and so on. So that's kind of a, <clears throat> excuse me, a mechanical structural way of thinking of inheritance. But there's also more of a logical conceptual way, which is that A is AB. If A is based on B, then A is AB. For example, if we have dog as a derived class of animal, then a dog is an animal. <clears throat> what holds for animals also holds for dogs because the base class animal defines what is common to all of the derived classes, dogs, cats, cows, humans, and so on. This is called the Liskov substitution principle because the idea is that you can substitute an instance of the derived type anywhere where a, the base type is expected because the derived object is an instance of the base type as well. And to allow for that in C sharp, um, you can implicitly convert a reference to a derived type to its base type. So if you have a method that has a parameter of type animal, you can pass an object of type dog to that method because a dog is an animal. So a reference to a dog can be implicitly converted to a reference to animal. So a derived type inherits all the methods and so on of its base type, but a derived type can also override the behavior of the base class. So for example, if animal, if the base class animal defines a move method, then the derived classes, say human, dog, and whale, they can each override the move method to provide their own behavior. So the base class just says, I can move, I have a move method, and it says what parameters it, the move method has, or what return value it has. But the derived classes can provide their own implementations that actually de determine what moving means for that particular class. So a human might walk on two legs, well as a dog, or as a dog walks on four legs, whereas a whale swims. All right, so we've talked about inheritance a bit. Inheritance a bit. Let's take a look at some code. So here in this program, we have a base class animal defined on line three, and we have a, it has a method called move. The method is public, so it's callable outside the class. It's virtual, that's what allows it to be overridden by derived classes. And it does not return anything, its return type is void, and it does not have any parameters, so the parentheses are empty. And this particular method doesn't do anything, it just has empty curly braces. The whole purpose of this, of declaring this method on the base class is that we want to be able to override it on the derived classes. So here's our dog class, which derives from animal. So dog colon animal means dog is based on animal. And now we provide our version of move for dog in which we override the method of the base class. In order to do that, we have to actually use the override keyword. Otherwise it's the same as the declaration we see on line five. And then inside the curly braces, we have dog's implementation of move, where we just output dog walking on four legs. Human, we do the same thing again, except we say human walking on two legs. And whale, we say whale swimming. So here's a little test function to demonstrate this at work. So I have a class called test. So it's demo1.test because we're in the demo1 namespace. Um, we have a static method called run. So we call this from, here we have the entry point of the program, we just call demo1.test.run. So we call that static method. So inside the body of that method, I create an array of animal. So new animal square brackets means we're creating an array of animal. And then inside the curly braces, we initialize the array to have these three objects. So we create a dog, a new dog, a new human, and a new whale. So we have three objects of three different types. None of them are are just animals. They're all derived types of animal. But because of the substitution principle, we can use a dog. We can put a dog in an array of animal. We can put a human in an array of animal and so on. So the static, the actual type of the array is simply array of animal. If we hover over the var, uh, the variable, um, the var keyword on line 37, we see that the type of that variable is deduced to be uh, uh, array of animal. That's because that's what we use to initialize it. Okay, so inside the, after we've created the array, we have a for each loop. So we'll execute the body of the loop once for each element of the array. So for each animal in animals, animals being the array, this is this loop variable animal will then be initialized 
um, will be bound to whatever the current element of the array is, and then we'll call the move method. So if I run this program, I say Control F5 to run it, then we get the output dog walking on four legs, human walking on two legs, and whale swimming because we the three animals in our array are a dog, a human, and a whale. So magically, when we called animal.move, even though the type of animal was just animal, the um, uh, the the method that actually got called was the one appropriate to the runtime type, the actual object's type. So the dogs, animal, the dog move, dog move, human move, and whale move are the methods that actually got called. Now, up here, we had our animal class with the move method that we never actually really used. It doesn't do anything. The only reason I created this move method was because I wanted to provide, I wanted to define that, that animals have this capability of moving. They have a move method, but I really want you to have to, to uh, the only reason this move method exists is so that it can be overridden by the derived classes. Well, there is a way to do just that. I can, instead of declaring this method virtual, I can declare it to be abstract. And then I delete the curly braces and put a semicolon here instead. And now what I'm saying is that this method, or this class, merely declares that there is a move method. It doesn't actually provide an implementation of that move method. So it's just defining the interface. It's not providing an implementation. Now, if I hover over the squiggles there, it's saying animal move is abstract, but it's contained in a non-abstract type animal. So anytime you have an abstract method, we have the class itself has to be abstract. So I put an abstract here as well. Oop. Lost my keyboard for a second. Abstract. Okay. So what this means is we cannot actually create an instance of the class animal. It's, it's just the class is just an abstraction, meaning that it represents what is in common to all of the derived classes. But we can't create something that is merely an animal. We can create dogs, we can create humans, we can create whales, but you can't create something that's just an animal. The abstract base class exists purely to say what is the, the, uh, the interface or the signature um, what is in common to the derived classes. In this case, we're defining an abstract method that those derived classes must override. And by the way, because it's, um, if this were virtual, we could choose not to override it, but because it's abstract, we must override it. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the concepts we just used in that simple program. So first of all, I talked about static type versus dynamic type. So when we had, when we created our array of animals, the static type was animal, but then each object was actually some derived type. So that's the static type is the type of the expression, for example, a variable, which is known at compile time, whereas the dynamic type is the type of the actual object, the actual runtime type of the object, and that's only known at runtime. So on this slide, on the right-hand side, we see we, we initialize a variable of type animal by creating a dog object. So that means that the static type of the variable A is, is, uh, is animal because that's what we declared it to be. But we know that the actual object that that variable is bound to is of type dog. And if we call a.move, we're actually gonna call the dog.move method. So that's called dynamic dispatch, meaning that when the derived class overrides the base class method, the method that actually gets called is that of the derived type. It's that of the actual, it depends on the type of the actual object that we're calling the method on, not just the type of the expression. So there's a mechanism there that allows, uh, that allows at runtime that, 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 uh, that the, actual, the actual appropriate method for the derived type to be called. And I've, so far I've just been talking about methods, but the same thing applies to properties, because in C-sharp, properties are really just kind of methods in disguise. Whenever you get a property, you're actually, under the hood, you're invoking a, a getter, a method that just gets the value of that property. And when you set a property, you are, under the hood, really invoking a method that sets the value of that property. So that's how properties differ from fields. A field is literally just a piece of data stored with the object. But a property 
is um, is 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 uh, is code. So this idea of 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 um, of having base types and derived types and having the behavior depend on what the actual derived type is is called polymorphism, which is kind of a concept borrowed from biology, which literally means many shapes. So you know you have animal. Uh, there's one kind of um, uh, interface defined by the base class animal, but what it actually does can vary depending on the derived type. So there's sort of many kinds of animals, many shapes of animals. So we also talked about, uh, I also showed you um, virtual versus abstract methods. So this is really, um, the idea here is interface versus implementation inheritance. So when we had the virtual method, the base class actually did provide a default implementation. Even if it was just curly braces that didn't do anything, there was an actual method there that could potentially be called. And the derived class has the choice of either inheriting the base implementation or overriding it. On the other hand, if you have an abstract method, the base class, class doesn't even provide a method at all. There's nothing there that can be ca literally called at runtime. All the base class does is declares the method, so it specifies what its return value and parameters are. So it's really just the interface of the method, using the term interface in a, in a general way to mean how things are connected. The derive class then must override the method because there is no implementation that it could inherit from the base class. And like I showed before, any class that has abstract members must itself be abstract, meaning you can't actually instantiate that class. C Sharp also has a concept uh, has there's an interface keyword in C sharp which is used to create an interface type um, and an interface type is like an abstract base class except that it only supports interface inheritance in other words you can only declare methods you can't have any fields you can't have a method and you can't have any method bodies there's not so there's nothing there's no um, a class in, uh, deriving from an interface doesn't inherit any implementation from that interface all it means is the class, the class will implement the interface itself. And the reason interfaces are useful is that, or one reason they're useful, is that um, in .NET, a class can only have one base class, but it can implement as many interfaces as it wants. All right, let's put these ideas to work using a slightly more complicated example. Again, we have a class hierarchy with animal as the base class. But now we have a couple different variations here. We have a abstract property, a read-only property. So um, this has a, a getter, but we haven't, uh, we haven't defined the property. We specified that it's abstract. So, uh, so, the, um, so derived classes have to override this. And of course, the class itself is abstract as well because it has abstract members. <clears throat> then we have a another property called has hair. This is a read-only property, <clears throat> and it's virtual. That means that a derived class can override it, but it doesn't have to because the base class provides a default implementation. The default imp implementation in this case returns false. This syntax, by the way, is the, the lambda syntax. This is a more concise way. We could, we could write this um, a little bit more verbosely by saying, we can say, I have a getter that returns false, like so. Or more verbosely still, by saying, return false, like so. But when you have a, uh, a read-only property that just returns a value, we can just <clears throat> use the lambda syntax and, and use a sing, uh, simple expression to say the value that it returns. Okay, finally, so we, that's the first two properties. We have an abstract property that's read-only. We have a virtual Boolean property that's read-only. And then we have a read-write property that is neither abstract nor virtual. And this is the age property, and this is a, has type integer. And in this case, I chose to actually, instead of letting the compiler generate the getter and setter for me, I chose to explicitly implement a getter and setter so that the getter returns the value of the age field, 
This field is private, so nobody outside the class can see it, but so it's part of the class's internal implementation. Um, and the setter stores the specified value in the age field. This class is neither, like I said, neither abstract nor virtual, so the so derived classes cannot override it. So we've kind of covered all three possibilities. Abstract means the derived class must override it. Virtual, the derived class can override it, but can also just inherit the base implementation. And neither abstract nor virtual means that the base class provides the implementation and the derived class cannot override it. Okay, so now we have a fish class, which derives from animal and simply overrides the name property. Then we have a mammal class, which also derives from animal. And this class overrides the has hair property. So this, remember, was declared as a virtual here. And the default implementation on animal returned false. The default, the animal, or rather mammal, overrides that with an implementation that returns true. Now, mammal does not override the name property. So that means that mammal itself has to be marked abstract. You can't create an object of type mammal. Rather, mammal serves as a base class for two other classes, dog and human. And dog um, uh, overrides, dog and human each override the name property, but they inherit the has hair property from mammal. So here we've demonstrated having a class hierarchy with more than two levels. So rather than just having a base class and derived classes, we can have a base class with a derived class, mammal, that in turn is the base for further derived classes, dog and human. And mammal can introduce functionality that is shared by its, um, by, by, by its derived classes. So dog and human each inherit functionality from mammal, which in turn inherits functionality from animal. Okay, so let's take a look at our little test function here. So we have our test class. We have a uh, class called test with a static method called run <clears throat> that we invoke from the entry point of our program. And similar to the last case, the last time we created a, uh, an array of, of animal, here we create a, we use the generic list type that's part of the .NET framework. Um, so we create a list of animal. So this is a generic parameter that means that this list can only, take, only contain objects of type animal or of derived types from animal. Um, then we add three animals to the list. Specifically, we add a fish, we add a dog, and we add a human. Uh, and again, this is the substitution principle at work. Um, because a fish is an animal, so it can be added to our collection of animals. If, on the other hand, I wanted to say animals.add hello, then we get an error because string cannot be converted to animal. They are not compatible types. So a string does not have an is a relationship with animal, but because fish, dog, and human are all derived from animal directly or indirectly, um, uh, then it means that we can we can uh, treat a dog. They have an is a relationship. A human is an animal. This syntax here, after we knew the fish, we then in, we include in curly braces. Um, it means that the uh, inside the curly braces we are setting properties. So we set the age property. So this is a convenient way of being able to um, instantiate an object using a new statement or a new expression and set properties on that object all in one um, expression. So we knew the fish and set the age property and then the resulting object that we've, you know, once with the age, uh, age being set is added to the animals list. And likewise for dog and for human, we each give them their own age. Then inside the for loop, for each animal in the animals list, we then call console.writeLine, and we use our string interpolation with the dollar sign in front to write the name property. We write age equals and the age property, has hair equals and the has hair property. And if we run this program, then we get fish, age equals one, because we initialize the age property to one on line 42, has hair equals false, 
because FISH has in, an inherited the base implementation of has hair um, on line six from the animal class. Then dog has age seven because that's the what we set the age property to on line 43. Um, and it has hair property is inherited from the mammal class because dog derives from mammal and mammal overrode has hair to return true on line 24. And likewise, um, human, we set the age to 42 and it has hair is true because again, it also inherits the implementation of that property from mammal. So we see how, uh, how we're able to override things. What about, I, I talked about age and how it's neither abstract nor virtual and therefore cannot be overridden. Let's see what happens if we try to override it. I'm just going to copy and paste these lines down here to the dog class. So I'll go ahead and copy and paste here. And just to make it easier to differentiate, I'm going to rename this variable to derived age. Okay, so now we have an age property on the dog class, and it is implemented in terms of its own field on this derived class. And we see that we get an error. If I try to build this, we'll get the, it won't, it won't compile. Oops, why won't, why did it compile? Well, I guess it's only a warning, not an error, so it will let us compile it. But if we want to make that warning go away, we have to say, public new int age. So the new uh, keyword here is warning us, or the warning exists because it may be unintentional that we have um, added a member with the same name on our derived type because the base, the base property is neither uh, abstract nor virtual. So maybe we thought we were overriding the base, but we really are not. What we're doing is we're creating a completely separate property that just happens to have the same name. So there's no virtual dispatch going on. When we get the, if we have a, a variable of type mammal that happens to be a dog and we get its age property, it's going to invoke the method on the base class because it's not virtual. It doesn't automatically then um, uh, invoke the derived method. There's no overriding going on. And that's why we have the new keyword. So if we really do intend to have this age property, then we use the new keyword so that we don't get a warning from the compiler to say, hey, I really mean to do this. But typically this is not what you mean to do, and I'll show you why. Let's go ahead and run this program. And we see now that dog has age zero. So, What's going on? So here we, we, on line 51, we set the age to seven, and on line 57, we got the age and, and it got zero. The reason that, that's, is that those are different is because these are referring to two different properties. This age property is in the context of a dog expression. So this is not virtual. So the, the, which property we invoke is based on the static type, not the dynamic type. So this age property is the property of the dog class. This age property, because we're invoking it on a variable of type animal, right? So if I want to be explicit, I can say animal. Okay, this is a variable of type animal. Um, and it's not virtual. It's neither virtual nor abstract. So when I'm invoking this method, I'm invoking it the method I'm invoking is determined by the static type, which is animal. So I'm invoking the animal age uh, property, property getter, whereas here I'm invoking the dog age property setter. I'm going to return, re remove these two lines and let's step into our program here so we can see what's going on. All right, building it again. Okay. Our dog. Meaning F11, the thing, I won't step through that. Then when we invoke the eval method, so I'm hitting F11, 
So now we are the primary, the primary, the top level expression is the product expression. So we're invoking its eval method. So if I step into that, it's going to invoke its left arguments eval method, which is a constant constant. This is the constant 1.5, if I remember right. Okay, so that just returns one. Step into the right arg, and we get the value 3. Wow. And then that's returned 10 to the third, or 1,000. And we return that from the, uh, from the, let's see. So that's the right hand, that's that's the, the result of right arg eval. So now we're going to multiply, we had the left, 1.5 was the left arg eval, was returned by left arg eval, 1,000 was returned by right arg eval. So when we return from this, we'll get the, and that's what we write to the console. So there is another example of the power of inheritance because it allows us to take different kinds of, of objects but compose them together because we can refer to the base type as a way of capturing what is in common between them. There are different kinds of expressions, but we can create a we can compose together expressions of different kinds because as long as they all um, as long as they all derive from that base type. Now. One thing that's interesting about, peculiar about this, is that this particular uh, class, the EXPR class, doesn't actually have anything in it. It doesn't have any implementation. It doesn't have any fields. It doesn't have any, any non-abstract methods. So it's really just pure interface. If we wanted to, we could change this from an abstract class to an interface. So let's do that. And by convention, it's typical for interfaces to start with the, with the letter I, like so. So I'm just using Control R R to rename this type, and it, and it automatically renamed all the references to that type. So now we call this interface I E X P R. And um, for an interface, it's implied that it's abstract, so I don't actually have to say that. And it's also implied that it's public because the entire point of an interface is to expose, is to basically declare methods or properties that have to be implemented by the derived types. Now in the derived type, um, it's, uh, so now we're inheriting from the interface, and in the derived type we don't use the override keyword when we're inheriting from an interface. For some reason, I'm not quite sure why that's not done, but um, but when you inherit from an interface, you don't have to actually declare that it's an override. It's just you're implementing that interface member. So we take out the overrides, but otherwise it's all the same and it will behave exactly the same. <clears throat> so if I run this, I'll get the same result. So why would I choose to use an interface rather than an abstract class? Well, one possible reason is that um, uh, if I just want to capture the idea that this could be any object that implements these methods, then I can, ca I can capture that in the interface. And then a kind of a practical reason is that a class can only have one base class, but it can implement any number of interfaces. And that's, that's uh, the kind of technical reasons why that, why why the inheritance model in .NET was designed that way, because uh, uh, allowing multiple inheritance of classes introduces some complexities that uh, uh, that uh, they didn't want to have in the implementation. Okay, so let's take a look at one final example that uses interfaces in a different way. So here is the uh, an interface that it is built into the .NET framework. It's called iComparable, and actually this is a generic interface. So it's so we have a class called Ratio, and it implements an interface called iComparable Ratio. And the iComparable Ratio method, or excuse me, interface, uh, defines a generalized comparison method that has a value type or that, that a value type or class implements to create a type-specific comparison method for ordering or sorting its instances. 
So this method here, compare to, is implementing the I comparable, um, is implementing a, a method, is implementing the method that it's um, uh, defined by the, or declared by the I comparable interface. So what this allows you to do is, what allows us to do is to compare, is to, uh, is to compare values of ratio with each other um, so that they can be sorted, for example. So ratio, we, had, we just defined this as having a numerator, uh, having numerator and denominator properties. And to compare them, we simply implemented a, this comparison function that um, essentially we're just cross multiplying like we would to get a common denominator um, and getting the uh, A then is the, this object's numerator multiplied by the other object's denominator. B is the other object's numerator multiplied by this object's denominator. And the semantics of compare to is that if this object is less than the other object, then the return value should be uh, zero, or less than zero rather. If this object is greater than the other object, um, then the return value should be greater than zero. And if they're the equal, then they should be equal to zero. So if this object A is less than B, the result should be negative. So we simply take A minus B, and that will automatically be negative if A is less than B. Um, and conversely, if A is greater than, if this object is greater than the other object, A minus B will be positive, and if they're equal, it will be zero. So this is just a very con uh, concise way of doing that. Uh, and this is a nullable type, so we have to do the null check. So if it's not null, then we do this comparison. If it is null, we'll just treat this object as greater. So we'll say any object is greater than null. Okay, so we've implemented compare to. What does that allow us to do? Well, there are certain things that automatically check for, oh, okay, here's another case. We've, we've actually overridden the to string method, which is inherited from object. So object is the common base class of all objects. So the, the root of the, of the inherited hierarchy is always object. And um, object actually defines a method called to string that by default just returns the name of the type. And, but we've overridden it here to return um, the numerator slash denominator. Okay, so here's our, our uh, test.run method. And I'll change this to call that demo for test.run. Okay. And <clears throat> we've created an array of ratios. So we have one over three, you know, one third, two over three, two thirds, nine tenths, um, one half, and three fifths. So a bunch of different ratios with different denominators. And then we sort them. So array.sort ratio, and we take the array of ratios. So how does it know how to sort them? It knows how to sort them by using our, by using the, um, because the sort method is aware of the I comparable interface. So it's using the, or I, our compare to method to, uh, to determine which objects are greater and which are less. Without having that method, it would have no idea which objects were greater and less. Um, and then we output the results. And here's what we see. And indeed, the objects are in the right order. One third, one half, three fifths, two thirds, nine tenths. Okay, so we see that that um, uh, a kind of pure, something that is just purely interface, for example, our IEXPR was purely interface. All it has is, um, is a declaration of what methods you have to provide, uh, but doesn't provide any implementation, doesn't have any fields. Such a thing can be, it can be defined as an interface rather than, a, rather than as a base class. And the .NET framework provides certain interfaces that are used for common things such as I comparable or I equatable and certain other things where that are uh, that allow uh, certain library things like sort to work correctly with user defined types. All right, the final thing I want to talk about is just to give a an idea of how all this works under the hood. That is how objects are represented in memory and 
and uh, and in particular how virtual dispatch how that is how um, virtual and abstract methods and properties work how it is they were able to override methods and how the, how how the the uh, the proper method how the proper code is executed based on the dynamic type of an object so first of all um, the, the, the memory of a computer it can be thought of as just a, a sequence of boxes laid out from zero up to some very large number. <laughs> There's just a lot of positions that are, that are addressed by, by just a number. Um, and each box holds a, you know, a byte or, or, or some, some value. Um, and an object is simply a sequence of these boxes or, you know, it's a, that, that, have a, that are laid out in a certain way. So, um, so if your object has a, has certain fields, those are just laid out from at the whatever the starting address of the object is. Those fields are just laid out in a certain order from that starting address. Now in .NET, every object has a uh, an implied field at the beginning. That's the virtual function pointer, what is shown here as VFPTR, and that pointer is point points to type information about the object. You don't have access to that as you know in, when you're writing your code. You don't have access to that. It's part of the underlying implementation of of .NET, and part of that type information implementation, or part of that type information rather, is a virtual function table that is created by the by the compiler, or the compiler, or the .NET runtime, or some combination of the two. That is what allows this virtual dispatch to work. So, for example, you have a dog object, and the dog object starts with the virtual function pointer that points to the dog the v table for the dog class and there's just one v table for the class you have any number of dog objects they all point to the same v table and that v table in turn has a an entry for each virtual function in that class so the dog class for example <clears throat> inherits uh, three uh, virtual functions from object. The object again is the, the root of the class hierarchy and the object class defines three methods called toString, getHashCode, and equals. Not necessarily in that order, I'm not sure. Anyway, it has those three methods that are potentially overridable. We, we overwrote our toString method in our um, ratio class, if you recall from the last example. Um, on top of that we have, um, we're assuming that there is an animal base class that defines a move method. So the dog class then has three virtual functions that it's inherited from object and a further virtual function that it's inherited from animal. So therefore there are four entries in the vtable. So at runtime if you invoke the, uh, if you have a variable of type dog then um, and you want to invoke its move method then the the code that actually executes on the CPU is going to uh, look up the V table by following that virtual function pointer, find the address of the move method in the V table, and then the it will the 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 code the 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 um, the, the the point of execution will actually jump or transfer to the address of the function that that points to, which is dog.move. And the same applies if you have like, if you have a, uh, the, the dog object for, and the, likewise human, of course, a human object has a VF pointer that points to the human V table and the move, the entry for move in the human V table is going to point to the human dot move, you know, the, the overridden move function defined by the human class. Um, now <clears throat> you'll notice that there's, there's a certain commonality between the dog object and the human object, which is that both of them inherit the, the, uh, the, all the animal members, and that includes any fields that are defined by the animal class. So a dog object includes within it a sub-object. The first part of the dog object is, whatever, is the stuff that it's inherited from animal, and then any dog-specific fields follow after that. Likewise, human has a sub-object that it inherits from animal, and then any human-specific fields are added after that. So that means if you have, say, a method that is implemented by the animal class and you invoke that method, the animal class can understand 
the, the object that it's referring to because it's looking at that animal subject, sub-object. The layout of all the fields and so on in that animal subject, uh, sub-object is what the animal classes methods understand and expect. Um, and if you have a variable of type animal, uh, that variable is, is, is uh, and you invoke, um, again, you invoke the move method on that variable of type animal, it's going to find either the, either, uh, it's going to call either dog.move or human.move depending on the actual dynamic type because it's call, making that call through the vtable. This is why when we uh, looked at one of our examples, uh, we had an age property that was not virtual. Um, uh, the reason that overriding wasn't possible is because there is no vtable entry for that. When you get the age property or set the age property, you're just directly invoking the method without looking up the address of that method in the vtable. The address is just known up front because you know exactly which method you're calling. So that is how the virtual dispatch works in .NET. Um, it does explain kind of how there is a certain a, a some cost to virtual dispatch because you're doing this level of indirection, but it's a pretty small cost. The main cost really is that you uh, it makes um, for a optimizer. It's a little harder. It, it can't inline functions that are virtual, so it um, uh, it eliminates some opportunities to optimize code. But generally speaking, if you if you need to use a virtual function, um, then you know if you weren't using virtual functions to achieve it, you'd be doing it some other way. So that's a perfectly reasonable thing to have. So to recap, we talked about um, kind of did a deep dive here on in inheritance and in .NET. If you stuck through to the end, then good for you. I appreciate you watching. Um, we looked over, we, we revisited the PowerShell example that I showed in a previous video, but we explained further what inheritance means. It's a concept from object-oriented programming, and we looked at some C-sharp demos that showed um, abstract and virtual methods as well as non-virtual methods, and how polymorphism, polymorphism, polymorphism and dynamic dispatch allow derived classes to override functionality of base classes. We also saw how uh, you can inherit just interfaces, that is just descriptions of how things, of what things can do, or you can inherit implementations, which is the actual code that does the thing. Um, and there's the interface interface types, which are just pure interface with no uh, no fields or or actual method implementations. Um, and finally, we we looked a little bit at how um, polymorphism actually works how objects are laid out in memory and how virtual functions are, are resolved by, by uh, using a level of indirection to find the, the address to jump to. So thanks again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Bye.